so inadequate that your spirit lives inside of me. And I just thank you, Lord, that I wouldn't be here for the next time. I just invite you to have your way. Every word that comes from your mouth is truth. And it brings life. It is right. but I think worship was really good. <laughs> I'm just so grateful to the Lord. I don't know. I think almost everybody here comes on Thursday nights, but um, you know, we've been discussing and I cannot, you guys gotta fix that whistle. Um, Discussing and um, seeking the Lord about how to encounter His presence in this place, in our lives. Um, and it's really good. You should come if you can. But um, we've been, you know, that's where the idea for the prayer um, before service generated from is where it started. We really decided, the group of us that come, that we want more, right? We don't just want to be Christians that go to church on Sunday and Bible study on Thursday nights and look like the world the rest of the time. And, um, and the Lord is showing us, right, that the place that the change and the transformation that we're looking for is found is in his presence. And so um, we decided, you know, we were going to come before the service started and just unite ourselves in prayer and ask the Lord to come and to inhabit this place, to inhabit our praises, and to manifest himself in a, you know, in a new way. Um, and I just believe that he is moving. I believe that he is answering our prayers. And I, I am just, I am overwhelmed with grace. Searching the scriptures this morning, and I read through. I was looking at 
Exodus. Or, uh, so the scripture where the Lord told Moses, he told the Israelites, you know, that he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to give the whole land into their hands all at one time, right? Because if he had, they wouldn't have been able to maintain it. He had to take it, you know, people by people and get one tribe settled and then get the next tribe settled and, and go and conquer the land that way, you know. And I know that in my life that, uh, that my, my deliverance has come that way, right? Like I didn't get saved and get delivered from everything that I was in bondage to and get totally set free from everything that I struggled with. The Lord over the years has progressively, you know, layer by layer come in and shown me areas and places in my heart and in my life that needed to be brought into submission to him so that they could be lands that were conquered for his name's sake um, and that I could maintain them. You know, and um, and I believe that the Lord is showing me now that the way that He reveals Himself to me is also that way, right? That when I got saved, I didn't just get to see all there was to Him and know everything that there was about Him, but that progressively, <laughs> layer by layer, moment by moment, He's just revealing more and more of Himself to me, to us, you know. And the more, not to sound like a song, but the more I see him, the more I encounter him, the more that I uncover another facet of his personality and his character, the more I want of him. You know? And I would love to tell you that, you know, I feel this way all the time. <laughs> I would love to tell you that there's never a moment in my day where I'm not in pursuit of the presence of the Father, but that would be a lie. There are so many times where I get distracted and go <coughs> off course from my true purpose, right? That's our true purpose. Not to, I guess they beat a dead horse because that's a terrible way to say that, but I'm not going to belabor the point except to say again, um, let us make man in our image. We were created to be image bearers. We were created to walk even as he walked in this earth. We were created to be a city on a hill. He says, you are the light of Christ to the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. <laughs> Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand and gives it light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence and recognize and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, I feel like for a long time I've been doing that backwards. I've been doing everything that people should see my good deeds and my moral excellence without the light to back it up, right? Living in this place of this is what it's supposed to look like, this is what a good Christian walks like, this is what they sound like, this is what they, they how they perform, you know? But none of that is of any consequence and none of it is effective without the light. You know, my husband taught weeks ago about the Lord's Prayer and how he believes that the Lord's Prayer is Jesus when he's praying in John to the Father and he says, you know, Father, I pray that you would make them one in me as you and I are one, that we would all be one together, right? And the truth of the matter is Jesus prayed that prayer and in his heart was nothing but purity and love. And it was in accordance with the will of the Father. And it is a prayer that will be honored and answered. We can, we can stake our claim on it. We can take it to the bank. He is going to unify us, right? From the beginning, he purposed 
that we would be made in his image, that we might walk in fellowship, that we might walk in relationship, that we might walk in intimacy with him. And even when we sin that we fell short of the glory of God, his plan has never changed all along. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be a light into the world. And then he, 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 he sent his spirit to come and to live inside of us that we might be vessels of that light, that we might share it everywhere we go. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care where you put me or what was going on around me. After a time of worship and fellowship in the presence of my father, you couldn't get me to talk about anything else. You couldn't get me to be more, to, to, to value anything more than my understanding right now of my position in him and his position in me, right? But I leave this place and I go home to my house and to my unsafe family members and to a lost and dying world full of people that even though they don't know what they're doing, choose, you know, don't choose, they just are operating under the curse of sin and death and deception. And I, and before long, I find myself out of that place of knowing my position in him, in his position in me, because I become distracted by the things of this world. And I believe that the only way that I am going to step into the fullness of what the Lord has for me in terms of being able to walk in this world, even as he was in this world, right? Because that's what we're called to, <coughs> is if I find the place of his presence daily. If I find the place of his presence at, at, at every opportunity, right, that I recognize that thing as my great need. My great need isn't food. My great need isn't money. My great need isn't an education. My great need isn't entertainment. My great need isn't the affection of men. My great need is not any of those things. It is the presence of my Father. It is the thing that I was created for. I was created to dwell in the presence of my Father. And there is nothing that is going to enable me, no amount of studying the Word of God, no amount of getting before the Lord and telling him all the things that are wrong in my life and what I need him to fix for me that is going to bring me into the place of his presence and transform me into who he created me to be. None of that will work for me. The only thing that will work is pursuing his presence through praise and thanksgiving and worship. It's how we enter the presence of our Father. We come in with thanksgiving and praise. And as we encounter him in the place of his presence, we cannot help but fall on our face and worship him. <laughs> because he is so good. He is so kind. He is so merciful. He is so gracious. He is so long-suffering. He's all the things that I want to be. He's all the things that I cannot make myself. No matter how hard I try, no matter how down on myself I get when I fail, no matter how prideful I get when I succeed, 
I cannot make that transformation in myself. It has to be done in the presence of my Father, right? We're getting ready to celebrate Independence Day. And I will tell you that I grew up in a house of people that were patriotic, that um, I, was t I was telling Steve and Luann the other night, we were watching fireworks, and I said, I'm telling you right now at 6 o'clock every morning without fail on the 4th of July, we would wake up to Stars and Stripes Forever playing as loud as you could possibly play it without the speakers being blown in my house. Every time you would wake up and it would be like, and you'd be like, oh gosh, Dad, please. I'm just trying to sleep. Just let me sleep, right? I mean, I grew up in a home that's patriotic, that loved this country love the freedom that my, my father fought for, you know? I, I do. I love this country. I love the freedoms that we have. But less and less am I patriotic, and more and more am I excited about my citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Less and less am I looking around at this place and thinking to myself, at all costs, we have to preserve that. And more and more am I looking around and saying, at all costs, I have to be preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the darker and darker it gets outside, the brighter and brighter the light inside me is going to shine. And so is it my desire that this nation would fall or that we would succumb to the darkness that's in the land? Of course not. I want my grandchildren to grow up and value the same things that I grew up valuing and to know what's important and to understand what's good and great about this nation. But the only thing good and great about this nation is that it was founded upon the principles, the scriptural, biblical principles of our Heavenly Father. It's why we've walked in blessing, and the more we walk away from that, and the more we pursue independence, the further we go from him, right? Um, I'm going to read scripture that I've read a lot lately, but I'm going to read it again anyway. I'm going to start earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Sorry, can I this back up again? Um, I'm going to start with Verse 12, since we have such a glorious hope and confident expectation, we speak with great courage. And we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites would not gaze at the end of the glory, which was fading away. But in fact, their minds were hardened, for they had lost their ability to understand. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed only in Christ. The veil is removed only in Christ. But, but to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil of blindness lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns in repentance and faith to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all, with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. My independence is found in the spirit of the Lord. I am no longer in bondage to the law of sin and death. But I have been set free, and I now am under the law of liberty, of life in the spirit. We have been discussing in our book study on Thursday nights, you know, the things that we do, the things... Um, that we 
that we want in our walk with the Lord, the things that we want to see in and amongst this body of believers, the things that we're excited about God doing. And as we've been talking about that, we've had to acknowledge, right, that it doesn't look like what we want it to. We're not there yet. We haven't arrived, right? We were talking about this past Thursday, you know, like the, the church at Pentecost and what that looked like. And the Acts 2 church and what that looked like. And how Jesus said, right, these signs shall follow those who believe. That they would, you know, lay hands on the sick and that they would be healed. And that they would cast out demons and that they would, they would raise the dead. That they would do all of these miraculous works that Jesus did and even greater. Right? And no offense to anyone here, and I hope this doesn't upset you. But I don't know about you guys. In my life, it's just not happening. And when it does happen, it happens with measure. Right? And I have to believe, because I know that God is good. I know that he is kind. I know that he is merciful. And I know that he's not a man that you should lie. He has told me that those things will follow me if I believe. He has told me. That that was his intention for what the church should look like and how they should operate and how they should move, right? And so if I look with my eyes, not in like a self-judging, self-analytical, let me tear myself down and apart kind of way, but just in an objective, in the light of scripture, do I see what this says in my life? My answer to that question is no, right? There are veils. We have veils. We have veils that are, that are in our way of clearly seeing the Lord. There are veils that, that skew the perspective that we have of who he is and what he is like. Because if they were not there, then we would take him at his word and we would operate exactly as it says in this word. Right? You can argue with me if you want. I'm, I'm open. Like, literally, I'm open. I know. I know that there are things, right, that I've decided that probably aren't right. There may even be things that I would say from up here in this pulpit that would not align themselves with the truth of the Word of God. And absolutely every single one of you is responsible if you don't understand or you think something is an error to come to me and to say hey i don't know what you said i don't understand it and if i'm understanding you correctly i don't agree with it it's our responsibility to know what this says and to know how to stand on it to know how to engage in it and to communicate about it with other people right it's our it's, it's our responsibility to study and show ourselves approved Sorry. So we have veils, right? And one of the things that we were talking about in book study the other day that I think is a, a preventative, right, for seeing the Lord operate the way that he wants to operate in our lives is, is a veil of, of, you know, not, not recognizing and understanding who he is and how good he is. And I talked about this a little bit last time that I talked. But if you believe what the word of God says, and if you have testimony in your own life of what God has done for you, then you must know that there is nothing in him that isn't good. Amen. Right? He's a good and perfect father who gives good and perfect gifts. And so, regardless of what is happening in my life and what is going on around me, my perspective cannot change from he is good. He is kind. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is holy. He is mighty. He is true. It has to stay in that place. And if somehow what's going on around me has drawn me out of the place of that perspective that he is good, that he is working, here it is, Sarah, that he is working all things together for my good, because I love him and because he's called me according to his purpose. Then I'm missing it. There's a veil. That's not what I'm seeing, 
right? And I think what happens is, our circumstances, they draw us off course. We haven't learned how to accurately take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ, and we haven't learned how to adequately cast down every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, right? What is the knowledge of God? What is he? Who is he? Right. Right. You know, I got cancer, skin cancer removed a few weeks ago from my body. Does that change the fact that God is a healer? Does it? Does the, the fact that it's the third time that I've had to have something like that removed change the fact that he's a healer? No. Does, you know, the fact that, um, you know, I have relationships with people in my life that I see that are perishing because of the decisions that they're making, and I pray for them. I pray that God would move and that he would intervene on their behalf. Does the fact that I don't see change in their life contradict the fact that he is faithful? No, it doesn't. Does the fact that I, you know, am struggling financially and, and, and I'm having trouble making ends meet and that we're living from paycheck to paycheck, does it change the fact that he is a God who supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus? No. I don't, does the fact that, and I'm not talking about my spouse, I'm just using this as, a, as an example, but does the fact that your spouse, right, isn't living the way that they're supposed to live, or isn't doing what they're supposed to do, or isn't honoring you the way that it says that they should honor you in the Bible, does any of that negate the fact that he is a good God and that he is working all things together for your good? No. No. He is unchanging. There is no shadow of turning in him. From the beginning, before the foundations of the earth, before he knit us together in our mother's womb, he was good, he was kind, he was faithful, he was merciful, he was long-suffering, he was perfect. He was love before, right? And even now, when when we see all of these things around us, he is still all of that. Why do we find ourselves drawn into a place of living in a way that does not reflect that truth? Right? Because if I believe that, you know, the the tumultuous relationship that I have in my life with one of my family members, right? If I believe that, that the way that that makes me feel and my right to talk about it and discuss it and share with others and unload and vent, <laughs> right, supersedes the truth of who he is and who he's called me to be, right? Because I'm to live and be and walk in this world even as he was, okay? That means that I'm, I'm like, I'm disaligning myself with him, right? If I choose to embrace and engage the fleshly side of things, I'm choosing to step out of alignment with the Father, to step out of alignment with the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, and I have to put up a veil. I have to put up a veil to do that, right? Because that thing, if I allow the light of my Heavenly Father, of His presence, to shine in that place, it cannot stay. It has to go. So if I want to serve this thing, I cannot do it without putting up a veil between me and my Heavenly Father. And sometimes we know when we put veils up, and sometimes we don't, right? I shared this, and I, like I said, I apologize for those of you who are here on Thursday night. I think that um, a lot of this is what we talk about, but that's okay because it's all good. Um, and I wish I could play the testimony for you, but it's just too long. Um, there's a, a pastor that I listen to who um, 
who was worldly, lived in the world, didn't want to really have anything to do with the Lord. He'd grown up a church, knew about church, basically conned his wife into marrying him by telling her he was a Christian, even though he wasn't a Christian and really wasn't interested in anything but her and what she could do for him. And um, so she was a Christian. And so for 13 years, she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and sought the Lord. You know, you know, God, you know, save my husband. You know, he get him right. Um, she went to Bible study. She asked for people to stand with her in prayer, to sit with her in prayer, to do all of those things. And for 13 years, she, you know, stood in the gap for her husband. And then finally, you know, things got so bad that she she was like, I'm done. I don't care anymore. You, I hate you. I don't love you. I don't want anything from you. I don't want to be married to you anymore. And God, as far as I'm concerned, you've never done anything for me either, so you both can take a walk. Was literally what she said to the Lord. And um, about six months later, this guy is standing in a warehouse at work, and the Lord comes in, and he's like, hey, I'd like to introduce myself to you. And this guy gets radically saved. And so um, for like six or seven months, he's just on fire for the Lord, just serving the Lord. Um, you know, not putting any pressure on his wife or his family or anything like that, but just pursuing the presence of his heavenly father, pursuing the voice of his heavenly father, pursuing that relationship that he understood now was his inheritance because of what Jesus Christ had done for him, right? That became the most important thing. It became his great need, his relationship with his heavenly father. And so he said during that six to seven month period, his wife did everything that she could possibly do to push his buttons to get him to fold and prove that this was all just an act and that he wasn't for really safe, right? And so finally... He, um, she is standing in the bathroom one day getting ready to go somewhere, and she said, Jesus just walked in the bathroom and said, um, I'm so glad that you stopped praying for your husband that way. And she was like, what? And she, he said, can't you see that that man, meaning her husband that day, that man isn't the man that you married. He's a brand new man. He's a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. He's not the man you married. He's not the man you've known for the last 16 years. He's a brand new man. Can't you see? And all of a sudden, you know, the scales fell off of her eyes. The veil was removed, and she was able to see that God had done this transformative work in her husband. And the Lord said to her, I couldn't do what I wanted to do in him while you were praying the way that you were praying because of the motive of your heart. Your motive for praying for him wasn't love because you saw that he was lost and dying. It was because you were tired of dealing with him and you wanted to have a better day. And until you stopped praying that way, I couldn't move in your husband's life because if I did, I would have somehow reinforced that that motive in you was okay and that it was all right for you to be praying from a place of selfishness. Right? Right? Guys, we have motive in our heart. We have presumption that God wants to do what we want him to do in our lives. And what happens when you have motive and when you have presumption is, eventually when the thing doesn't move the way you want it to move, you become disappointed, you become bitter, or you just kind of begin to excuse the fact that things aren't working the way that they're supposed to because, well, God just doesn't move that way anymore. <clears throat> if he did, he would have moved in this area. And the reality of the situation is he doesn't move that way. He moves any way that he pleases, and he's not going to move in a way that would reinforce a mindset or a motive or a presumption in you that would ultimately be dangerous to you in your life, right? Right? He's not going to move in the lives of my family that aren't saved and aren't pursuing the Lord because I'm praying from a place of fear. Because what might happen if they don't eventually give their lives to the Lord? Because if I continue to pray from a place of fear about 
what might happen to them, he's reinforcing to me that my prayer should be motivated and moved by fear. I am to come before the Lord declaring to him and telling him and sharing with him that I believe him, that I know that he knit them together in their mother's wombs, that before the foundations of the earth, he had a plan and a purpose for them to give them a hope and a future, plans to prosper them and not to harm them, that I declare, right, that there is, there is nothing that could separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus, that I come and I declare the words of my heavenly Father over them, not from a place of fear, not from a place of doubt, not from a place of, like, anxiety and wringing my hands, but from a place of knowing who my God is. From the same place that David stood before he went before Goliath and said, I'm not sure that you know who my God is, but I don't care how big you are and what you say you're going to do to my bones. He's got my back and it doesn't matter. That is to be my position. My position when I am facing the hardships, the things in life that are going on that, that strive to draw me off course and out of the place of his presence, out of the shadow of his wing, <laughs> out of my hiding place, that rather than <laughs> addressing them the way that the world does, to find, find my place in his presence, to allow him to show me and minister to me through his word what he has to say about this thing. Right? Right? Whatever it is, whatever the storm is that's raging against me, it, there, there is literally nothing I could do, nowhere I could go, nothing I could say that would be more effective than the leading and guiding voice of the Holy Spirit and my Heavenly Father inside of me. You know, Dwayne asked a question. He's like, how do you hear the voice of God? And um, I was listening to a teaching this last week by Derek Prince on worship. And he was talking about how it is in worship that we hear the voice of the Lord, you know. And he said, not that that's the only way that we can hear the voice of the Lord, but that is where we hear the voice of the Lord. And he said, you know, more often than not, more like in a church service and things are going on and people are prophesying or doing this, that, and the other. He said, you know, people say stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, praise the Lord, that's fine, whatever, put it on a shelf. He's like, but when we are in a, a service where there is a spirit of worship, where everyone is, is on their face and they're worshiping the Lord and he speaks, he said, I listen. Because it is in that place the Lord cannot resist. He cannot, it is, it's like, he talked about how, um, you know, in the Old Testament, the Lord talked about the different offerings that were to come, right? And there was like the um, offering of um, wheat with, or like, grain with oil and all these different things and what they represent, how they were like types then and what they represent now. And he was talking about how frankincense scent is always worship, right? It's a fragrance that rises, but it is a fragrance that is irresistible to the Lord, right? And it's a fragrance that we're not to offer to anyone but him. But in that place of offering that fragrance of worship to the Lord, he cannot help but come into fellowship with him. We enter his gates with thanksgiving. We come into his courts with praise. As we, you know, go from praise and thanksgiving into that place of worship, the Lord is here, and he cannot help but come and engage with us in that place. It is in that place where the veils are revealed. God shows us what is keeping us from the place of his presence. He allows us to see his face. He allows us to see his glory as with unveiled face so that we can be transformed from who we are being shaped and molded by this world and by Adam and by the, the destiny and plan and the purpose that Satan had for us when he drew us in the garden to sin to the place that God has always intended for us to be his image bearers, the carriers of his great name. I believe that everything that is happening, everything in our lives, all of the, you know, the difficulty, all of the toil, all of the, the, the hard things, all of those things are designed 
and in our lives because they are intended to draw us into the place of dependence upon the Father. And I believe that if we learned that and applied it in our lives and decided that our great need was his presence and that we were going to make the time seeking that place our priority instead of everything else that we let get in the way of that, I do believe that the storms would diminish. I believe that there would be less of them. I believe that they would still come, but I believe that they would be like, whatever. It doesn't matter. Right? You know, we were talking about I'm spitting, sorry. Um, uh, Peter jumping out of the boat and walking on the water, right? And taking his eyes off of Jesus and like looking down and seeing what was going on and going, oh no, right? And beginning to sink. And the thing about it is, is I believe if he had kept his eyes, as we're talking about, if he had kept his eyes focused on Jesus, right? He never would have sunk. Didn't mean that the wind and the waves weren't whipping around him. Didn't mean that there wasn't like scary stuff going on and that normally it would have looked really treacherous for him to be doing what he was doing. Nonetheless, it would have he would have been unaffected by it. He would have not been moved because his eyes were in the correct place. And I, I think that we can come to church every Sunday. We can sing praise. We can sing Thanksgiving. We can, you know, read the word. We can lay out our laundry list of things that we need the Lord to do in our lives. But I do not believe that those things are going to ever draw us into the place of his presence. We have to determine and make a decision that we are going to seek him, that he may be found. As we draw near to him, he draws near to us. And it is in that place of pursuit, in that place of engagement, in that place of fellowship and intimacy, that he comes in and that he shines the light that he has given for us to bear and he reveals the veils that are keeping us from manifesting our true destiny of being image bearers for him in our lives. And we have to learn how to look at what's going on and evaluate if, if, if what is being produced isn't love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, meekness, patience, faithfulness, or self-control, then we are, we are operating through, we are looking through a veil. We are not seeing accurately, and we will not act accordingly. We will not respond in a way that is going to produce life, right? And where that starts is knowing that he is good. It's knowing that he loves us. It's knowing that his kindness his loving kindness endures forever. It's knowing that his love is unfailing, that it never takes account of the wrongs that we've done to it. Every day, every day, every day, more than I don't even know how many times a day, I choose things that are in opposition to who he's called me to be. Every day. And every time he comes and he says, hey, I had to repent to my husband before the service, right? I had to be like, hey, I'm really sorry I got offended with you. And I was, we were doing worship practice, and I started to worship the Lord, and it was like, I, I couldn't, <laughs> right? Because I knew there's this thing that's keeping me from being able to enter in and see him as he truly is. And I cannot have that. I can't have that in my life. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you're irritated with somebody, having to humble yourself before them and be like, I'm offended with you, it stinks. And that's the genteel way of saying what I really wanted to say. But his love, when I repent, it keeps no account of my wrong. He doesn't look back and think, yeah, 20 times yesterday you chose yourself over me. Yeah, 20 times yesterday you chose yourself over your husband or 
you chose yourself over your kids or your grandkids. 20 times yesterday, you didn't listen to the leading and guiding of my Holy Spirit because it would have been inconvenient for you. He doesn't come back and throw that in my face. He comes back and he says, don't you know how much I love you? Don't you know how forgiven you are? Can't you see the lengths to which I've gone to make sure you know and understand how I feel about you? Don't you know how good I am? Come and find yourself in the place of my presence. Experience my love so that you can look at others and love them the way that I love you. You know, I think I told you guys a few months ago, the Lord gave me, like, um, that song, you know, um, The Goodness of God. You know, it says, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you've been so, so good. And the Lord just came in the bathroom one day when I was getting ready to listen to that song, and he just, like, <laughs> opened up my whole life, you know. And I was so wounded for so long because of the things that took place in my family when I was growing up. I was so hurt and wounded because of my parents' divorce and all of the things that happened surrounding that. And for just the longest time, I was a victim to it, right? I let that be my identity, and I let it drive how I operated in the world, right? So, you know, my parents were supposed to stay together. They were supposed to be a firm foundation. They were supposed to, to love me the way that kids are supposed to be loved. They weren't supposed to you know, love themselves more than they love me. Um, and so, you know, my foundation was rocked. And because my foundation was rocked, I went out and tried to find any and everything that would soothe the pain that I was experiencing because of what had taken place in my life. And so I, I began to identify with that thing that had happened to me and, and make excuse for the way that I was living my life because it enabled me to cover up and to you know, to bury that pain and that wound, you know, and drugs and alcohol and all of the other things that I participated in when I was younger. And the Lord opened up all of that. And he let me see that when my parents divorced, when my family broke, he was good. He was there. He was faithful. All my life, every moment of every day. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if I would know the way, not the Lord, the way that I know him, if that thing hadn't happened to me, right? And so when I look at, like, issue that I'm having with people in my life, relationship that I'm having with people in my life, right, and my temptation is to get angry and upset and offended and irritated because don't you know that you're not doing it the right way, Right? I want to get self-righteous. I want to get like, well, where God says this, right? Don't you know that the Lord said, thou shalt not, right? My, my temptation is to come and to bring everything back under the law and point fingers and let everybody know how they don't measure up to the expectation that God has for their lives. That is so anti-Christ. He literally, he literally, he went to the cross for all the people that did everything wrong. For all the people that didn't live according to the law. For all the people that were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For all the people that abused him and beat him and defamed him. All of those people, he went to the cross for them. Right? That is my example. That is the place that I'm called to. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He was able to do that because he walked in unified fellowship with his heavenly Father. He never lost sight of him. He never took his eyes off of him. When he was reviled, he didn't say, those guys are rude and mean, and I don't like the way that they're talking about me. He said, Father, they don't know. They're deceived in their hearts. If they understood who I was and why I was here, they would, they would love you. They would embrace you. They would make me 
king. They would set me on a throne and they would worship me, but they don't know. I cannot give myself excuse. I cannot rationalize laying a hold of those thoughts that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. I have to take them captive to the obedience of Christ. You know, for a long time, I, and it, it does mean this, right? So when I heard that scripture, take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ, cast down every thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. I think I said it backwards, but whatever. You know, I, I would hear that scripture, and I would be like, okay, I don't have enough money to pay my bills. God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. I got a cold. Praise God. By his stripes, I'm healed. Right? So I would declare the word of God. And that is what that means. Right? That, that is an example of doing what uh, Paul is talking about there. But I'm going to tell you even more than that. It is. I don't care what is going on in my life right now, God. You are good. You are in the middle of it. You are kind. You are merciful. You are gracious. And if someone is in my life or some circumstances in my life that is vying for me to draw off of course and out of the place of understanding that, it's my responsibility to look at it and go, God, I thank you for this thing. I thank you that you've exposed a veil. You've exposed a weakness. You've exposed a place in me that <coughs> seeks to draw me out of my eternal destiny of walking in unison, in unity with you and your son, Jesus Christ, and to set me in the place of sonship that you always intended me to be, to set me in the place as your image bearer. I cannot do both of those things. So when someone comes and they start poking at that wound, at that place, and want to you know, open me up and get me to respond in a way that I wasn't created to respond, I have got to learn how to recognize that thing for what it is. It is a, an attack from my enemy to draw me off course and to make me ineffective in my walk with the Lord. And so what I have to do is I have to go, God, I thank you and I praise you that this thing is happening in my life right now because if, it, if, if I wasn't bothered by it, if it didn't, if it didn't cause me to like want to be like, when you act the way I don't want you to act, then I wouldn't know that that thing is there. You have exposed something and revealed something to me that I didn't know about myself, something that was hidden. You brought your light in and you've shown your light, right? Here's the good news. I chuckled about this because the Lord gave me the scripture when I was outside reading. And I was like, Sarah Sorry. said this earlier. She asked me if I had any scriptures and I said no. She goes, Romans 8? I was like, well, you know. Here's the good news. The Lord allows me to see those things. He allows me to become convicted of my sin, of my responses towards others, of my unloving, unforgiving, I've got a right to feel this way, I'm going to tell you what I think about what you're doing or how you're doing it or whatever, right? He allows me to see that thing. He allows me in his kindness to repent. He draws me to repentance because of his kindness. He overwhelms me with his reckless love that doesn't let me stay in that place of depravity and of sin and of deception and of separation from him. But he draws me into a place of repentance by shining his light on the veil that is keeping me from seeing him as he is truly meant to be seen by me. And as soon as he does, praise God, there is therefore now no condemnation for me because I am in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirit of life is in, in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. When he comes and he exposes those weak places in me and he shows me the areas where I'm not submitted, where I still have not subdued and replenished, right? We talked about that today. The Lord said to Adam, subdue the earth and replenish it, right? Subdue my flesh and replenish my spirit. That's what I'm called to do. When I haven't been living in that place of subduing flesh and replenishing spirit, and the Lord comes and he says, hey, I love you. You weren't made for this. You're better than this. 
I created you to speak life, to speak love, to pour out, uh, you know, uh, um, a product, like uh, the fruit of the Spirit, to, to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is the character of our Father. And when we manifest the character of our Father, we manifest the glory of God. Amen. It is why it says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We were created to manifest his glory so that people would see it. When he comes and he reveals to me that I have somehow stepped outside of that place of covering, outside of that place of pursuit of his presence, I don't have to get condemned I don't have to get downtrodden. I don't have to run from him or hide from him or go deeper into the hole. I have to own it. I have to be quick to agree with my accuser. I have to ask for his forgiveness. And I have to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am forgiven and set free from the law of sin and death. That I have been brought under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and it has displaced the law of sin and death from my life. It has no authority and no right to operate in and through me. Amen. I agree. you 
that you might know that our lives are a living sacrifice to you, Lord. That we would willingly lay down what you have given us as a gift, Father God, that we might take up the destiny of eternal sonship, eternal priesthood, eternal kingship. We lay down our lives, Lord, before you. Come and show us the way. Show us the way. Help us, God. Pour out your grace upon us that we might climb up on the altar, Lord God, and lay ourselves down as a living sacrifice to you, Father God. Lord, I believe that you are good. I believe that there is nothing that you require of me or ask of me, Father God, that will not result in benefit to me spiritually and eternally, Lord. I believe that there is not a circumstance in my life, there is not a relationship in my life, there is nothing that is happening in this earth today that isn't attend intended to draw out your purpose and plan for me, your destiny and your image for me, Lord God. I thank you for every single thing that has happened, whether it's sad, whether it's painful, whether it is hard, Lord. I thank you that you have called me to persevere and to endure, Lord God, that I will, as an overcomer, Father God, as an overcomer by the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and the word of my testimony, not love my own life unto death, but that I will willingly lay it on your altar, that it might produce the most sweet-smelling, pleasing aroma to you, Lord God, that you would not be able to resist <laughs> but coming and manifesting in this place, Lord God, in our present, Lord, Lord, presence, Lord God. Show us, Father. Show us how to pursue this thing, not just here on Sunday nights, Lord God, but show us how to pursue it in our lives every day. God, we thank you that you wouldn't have called us to it, that you wouldn't have showed it to us in your word if you didn't intend, Father God, for us to be able to accomplish it. We thank you that it is by your grace and your strength, by beholding you, Lord God, as with unveiled face, that we are transformed from glory to glory. And we are just grateful and thankful to you. We believe you, God. We do not lay down our belief about who you are or where you are or what you are doing, God, for anything that we see, Father God, because we walk by faith and not by sight. We know you are good. We have evidence of it in our lives every single day. We look around, God, and we see your creation, Father. And we know, Father, that you are perfect, that you are awesome, that you are powerful, that you are real, and that you are true. And we just thank you, and we praise you, and we give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God.